And then an exciting message that was very powerful, very, uh, without going too far into that, I turned to Dr. Lee after it said, it was very compelling to me personally. It really struck a few chords with me personally that I'll share with her later. But I, w I was certainly, uh, as many of you I'm sure were engaged by it. Here's what we're gonna do for the next few minutes. Uh, Dr. Lee's going to kind of talk for about 15, 20 minutes about what she did, how she laid it out and so on, just about the message. And then uh, Dr. Pierce is going to come up and guide a Q&A time. So you'll see there's, there's my, two microphones in here and uh, feel free to come up and ask a question and I'll let her guide that kind of process. But that's kind of how we're structured until about 1.15 or so, okay? So uh, once again, would you welcome with me Dr. Lee. Thank you so much again for having me here. I um, was asked to talk a little bit about some things in my book and, um, and how that relates to what I did today. Um, I thought it'd be much more fun if I could just focus more on the practical, because um, I've noticed just in my experience when I work with students, they read a lot, but they sometimes just have a really a hard time trying to bridge that gap, that jump from the text to preaching, and you know it's always hard. It's hard for me too. So I thought maybe I'll just you know it'll just be an open time, and I'll just talk to you just very honestly about what was hard for me, and if you have questions for me about my sermon, then I can at least tell you uh, what I thought through. So I'll just kind of give you my share my thought process, and in um, as I do that, I'm also going to just pull out some ideas from my book as well, and maybe read even some sections. Maybe hopefully that'll help you to make sense of what I did. So in my book, uh, the final chapter, as I kind of move from theory to more into practice, I mention uh, four, uh, what I call four perspectives, uh, four perspectives. Um, and I really tried to be mindful of that in this preaching because uh, one, I was tasked to do that, is to, again, to apply the ideas from my book in my sermon, so I try to be mindful of that. But I think the four perspectives that I write about in the book is actually really helpful to preaching, so maybe it's something that you might want to consider, um, maybe something that you want to just kind of hold on to in your back pocket and, and think about going forward. But the first perspective I talk about is retrospection, and this is really four perspectives, four um, practices of mindfulness that help us to be more mindful about God's actions, just broad scope of God's actions. So not just in the past, but also God's continuing actions today and also the future as well. So the first thing I talk about is retrospection, retrospection, which is attention to God's historical actions. Uh, retrospection is attention to God's past actions in the theodrama. So theodrama is what I really write about, um, obviously interacting with Kevin Van Hooser's um, uh, uh, theology and his ideas, and also just other scholars as well. But retrospection is attentiveness to God's past actions in the theodrama. Such work most significantly involves reading and studying scriptures to learn about the triune God who reveals himself to us in, the, um, in it and the economy of salvation, but it includes more. Broadly speaking, retrospection in retrospection, we consider what God has done so far in history and thus it reflects on the salvation history depicted in scripture and continued in the church's past story of faith. So what you're doing right now in your seminary, um, just church history classes, your Greek classes, your, your Hebrew classes, your systematic classes, all those things are really there to help you understand what has God done? How do we understand scripture? What are God's past actions? Um, what did God do in, in history? Uh, um, and what has God's actions been? So those are the kind of the disciplines we apply in this stage to, to think about God's act past or historical actions. The work of the preacher in this perspective is to consider the historical background of the sermon text, its literary features and theological themes and message. So the historical background, the historical critical things about the text, its literary features and theological themes um, in the message. So for example, on this sermon on the Magnificat, I had to consider several things. Um, and obviously there's just so many, but I will just try to do my best to, to pull out a few and share them with you. One is that the purpose of Luke's gospel is to show the inclusion of the Gentiles. So I had to think about the, the purpose of one of Luke's interests in writing this gospel, um, which is one of them is the inclusion of the Gentiles, the unexpected outsiders in the kingdom of God. 
um, or that Luke seems to underscore the urgency of our participation in God's activities as people who live between Christ's first and second coming. And that's a huge theme for Luke as well. And he shows that there is a period between Jesus' first coming and second coming, and so people are not confused, left to wonder. He shows that there will be that period, but you are to live faithfully and participate in that story. Luke also seems to be particularly interested in showing us that Jesus resets our understanding of power. Um, and as Christ followers, we must also exercise power wisely in fear of God. And that seems to be a pretty strong emphasis for Luke as well. Um, in particular, he is very interested in not just any, just any reorientation of power, but particularly how people use wealth and riches. And so that's a theme that you see in Mary's song as well. Um, so you can really say, see that Mary's song is kind of a snapshot of the, all of the whole entire Gospel of Luke and all the themes that are coming out from now. So those are some things that I had to be mindful of. Um, also, the larger themes of Luke include God's sovereignty over history, so that what uh, the, the news that Mary hears is not something that God decided to do yesterday, but, but God has been at work and he's been sovereignly uh, working out his plan um, to to bring salvation to 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 the world, um, and also he emphasizes the arrival of God's kingdom through Christ, which is uh, very obvious in the passage we saw, but also the out the continuing outworking of it through the Spirit's ministry on earth. And although the text today was maybe at a first glance that may not be so obvious. But I feel like that's, it's, that's an important part of Luke's gospel that I really wanted to draw out, which is why in the sermon, I really went from talking about the past and how this kind of the passage elicits past images of God's acts. But I also talk about future, the prophetic aspect of this passage. But I try to bridge the past and the, the, the future by talking about the present, the continuing act of God today that we often tend to miss when there's so much bad news. Um, also, another huge theme for Luke, uh, and you know this well, is the great reversal of God's kingdom taking place all over the world. So it obviously Mary is kind of this prophetic proclaimer um, in that sense. And so she talks about God's kingdom that reverses the world's order. And that and then I wanted to show that that is a key theme in Luke and that reversal is now taking place all over the world already. Um, so there's, those are some uh, theological, literary, and historical things that I wanted to look at. But also more immediate to the text and its context, I also had to consider things like the narrative flow of Luke, which I mentioned at the beginning, that, that Luke kind of moves very fast at the beginning. He's like introducing different characters. The, the pacing is pretty fast. But then when he introduces Mary and then Elizabeth, then the narrative pace kind of slows down and there is an extended section on Mary uh, that, that's as if to spotlight Mary and say, this is an example of a faithful disciple. And obviously there are many other faithful disciples that appear in the gospels, but that is really one of the first uh, disciple that he showcases. Um, the text is also rooted in Mary's story and in the story of Israel. Um, and both stories are in part of God's greater story. And that's obviously something you will see very clearly in the text as well is, here's Mary's story, what God has done for me, but it's not just my story, this is Israel's story, and in fact, this is all of our story, all of the stories of God-fearing people. So those are some things that are important to Luke, to this passage that I had to consider. Another obvious thing that you may have uh, noticed in the passage and that I tried to bring out in my sermon, which I don't know if I did too well, is that the text is filled with Old Testament um, allusions. So there's just tons of images that, that would make you think about, hmm, this sounds like some Old Testament passage of what God's done. Um, and when you felt that, you're absolutely right. There are so many Old Testament allusions in this passage. Um, so, for example, there is a lot of parallels between this passage and Hannah's song. So I try to allude to that as well, but not do it in a way that kind of just explains the text, but because it's a song, I wanted to weave it in naturally. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But so there are Old Testament allusions that had to be tied into this passage. Um, Another thing that was a challenge is that even though these are Old Testament allusions, I had to be mindful of the fact that this has to then apply and mean something for 
the people who are now grafted into, uh, grafted to Israel's story. So all of us who are listening won't just look at it as, yes, yes, that happened in the past, yes, that's in the Old Testament, but we understand the meaning and significance of those allusions in, in the way it speaks to, they speak to us today. So that was a huge challenge. So here's what I can say about retrospection in preaching. Retrospection is integral to the preservation of the Christian memory. The acts of recalling and retrieving are crucial not to lose, forget, or allow what is central to Christian theology to get distorted with time and distance. The epic in the theodrama grounds our performance in the biblical canon and allows us to be consistent with it. Knowledge of what has happened so far in the story also helps us to know our parts and fully commit to acting them today with flexibility and adaptability. Introspection keeps our performance of the theodrama not only accountable and conforming to scripture, but also congruent with past ecclesial performance, the church history, which may be resourced and refocused in our time. Retrospection is unproductive and futile without the other three perspectives which I'll introduce, however. Retrospection runs the danger of a narrow focus on a single text that makes it difficult for listeners to grasp how it fits into the larger biblical narrative. If you're just preaching the, the text in front of you as if it's an isolated text that you're retrieving past historical things about the text, then um, it can be very myopic. Um, it, it makes it difficult for listeners to grasp how it fits into the larger biblical narrative. This limitation can result in sermons that, while informative and interesting, with impressive exegetical hermeneutical content, do not re effectively move people to action because the significance of the information is unclear in relation to them. And it does not speak to their present experience of being in the world. And I think all of us have uh, experienced that many times in some, under some pulpits, or we have done it ourselves, where <laughs> you finish a sermon, you're like, now why did I just preach it that way? Because I don't think it connected with people. Um, so retrospection uh, is very important. Um, obviously, you are studying right now in seminary to learn the tools that allow you to do this kind of important work. But at the same time, uh, retrospection by itself is not enough. So let me introduce you the second um, uh, perspective to keep in mind. It's introspection, attentiveness to God's present action in us. Introspection considers what God is doing today through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in us. It's the work of honestly examining our spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, and social state of being in the world before the word of God. So for this sermon, I had to pray and self-examine how the text speaks to me. Um, what prevents me from singing like Mary? Why am I so hesitant? Why is there no joy in my heart? Um, what does my inability to surrender and fully offer myself to God say about me and my relationship with God? Um, how does this text give me hope? How can I identify with the lowly in this text and give thanks to God who has looked after me and reversed uh, my fortunes too? But at the same time, how does this text convict me? Um, for example, that I am the lowly, but also the proud, powerful, and the rich, which I tried to mention the in the sermon, that Mary's song is a litmus test, uh, test for all of us. Um, and how can I join in Mary's song? How, can, how does it threaten my enjoyment of power? Um, what is the new work that God is trying to do in me in this text? Um, so before I can, con that I can point people to God's continuing presence today, I had to reflect as a preacher on how this text speaks to me first. Introspection is important for at least three reasons. First, it allows preachers to view themselves and their lives as belonging to the theodrama and as part of God's renewing ministry that is also extended to them. God's kingdom drama is unfolding not only out there in the world, but also within each one of us, inviting us to more deeply and fully participate in the divine life. As preachers of the gospel, we preach Christ to all who need to be forgiven and saved to enjoy the creator's gift of abundant life, including ourselves. Introspection is vital to preaching because through this process, scripture becomes personal to us. Second, introspection allows preachers to get in touch with their humanity and speak authentically to connect with the congregation as fellow human beings. If Charles Bartow, the homiletician, is right that the task of preaching is turning ink into blood, 
the process, of, the process of introspection takes a step closer toward that goal by relaying the incarnational word to the church. Along with extrospection, we will dis which we will discuss next, introspection develops our contextual sensitivity. Third, with introduction, through, through introspection, preachers can discover their preaching voice, which is not just a matter of vo a vocal sound, but is also a deep expression of Christian integrity, delight, freedom, and self-discovery in the spirit. Breaking away from a compulsive need to mimic the preaching style of others, which we're all tempted to do, versus healthy aspiration to learn from others, introspection trains preachers to be fully in their own skin, sit in the tensions in their own lives, and own every part of their story, and in the midst of it all, find that God is present right where they are and is doing a new thing in them. The danger of introspection, if it's not combined with the other three perspectives, however, is that it can get easily absorbed in me and Jesus kind of spirituality that diminishes God's drama of cosmic redemption into a private story of individual salvation and sanctification. Also, sermons produced purely by introspection may emotionally connect with listeners, but in the end, people have little to go on without a clear word from God from scripture that forms and nourishes them, or that they are driven uh, to try harder to become better on their own without the gospel that exposes the lies of the enemy and gives them genuine hope in God's word. Yet when introspection is done carefully in prayer with scripture in the fellowship of believers, it helps us internalize the theodrama through instruction of our mind and connection to our hearts, propelling us to go out into the world. So that's introspection. Um, extrospection is the third perspective. Extrospection is attentiveness to God's present action around us. Extrospection is attentiveness to God's present work in the world, more accurately. Specifically, we must consider two contexts in extrospection, local and global. We should consider the local context by thinking about who the listeners are, like what's sacred to them, what's, what are their core values and beliefs, what issues are most pressing in their lives. But we also need to be mindful of the global context, which we uh, often don't think about. This includes remembering the global church, that God's story isn't just about us, but includes people from every nation and tribe, and the events that are impacting people all around the world. So in preparing this sermon, I was mindful that I'm speaking to faculty and students of TEDS, my audience, uh, people who are dedicated Christ followers who confess that Jesus is our everything. So I focus on bringing us together around our shared confession, our sacred confession, that Jesus is our sovereign Lord and Savior, and together we can reflect on what it might mean then for us to live faithfully as Christ followers. The response, uh, for example, in this particular text is, of course, to, to sing. It's inviting us to sing as faithful disciples as an expression of opening ourselves up to God's work in and around us. Um, so that's something I wanted to be mindful of. I was also aware that all of us have gone through a lot the past two years in a global pandemic. And in many ways, we're still privileged compared to most of the world, like our education opportunities or that w the fact that we live in this country with so many resources. Um, I also wanted to touch on the global context, like struggles of people in different places, the experiences of the global church. And we need a, uh, because I feel that we need a, a worldwide vision of God's kingdom and remember the voices and experiences of those who are day to day left out in our thoughts and memory, which Mary's text actually challenges us to think of those people and think about where we are in God's story. This also aligns with what Luke does in his account when he tells stories of unexpected people all throughout the gospel, like the lepers, the paralytic man with his four friends, Levi, the tax collector, and so on. Um, I think all sermons, but this sermon in particular based on Mary's revolutionary song, um, it needed to point listeners to God's continuing demonstration of mercy and power today through the Spirit's ministry. This is so that the listeners can know that their lives are the epicenter of God's activities and can join God's mission. Let me quickly read uh, an excerpt uh, from the book about uh, extrospection. <clears throat> 
Attentiveness to God's present action in us, introspection and around us, extrospection, is insufficient without scripture's witness of Christ, but joined with retrospection, these two perspectives help us consider our stories along the continuum of the theodrama. Also, although all four perspectives at play, at play in a theodramatic homiletic emphasize reading scripture with the whole church, the living tradition of past and present believers, and thus requires the development of Catholic sensitivity, extrospection highlights this importance further. The danger of extra extrospection, if it's not done with the other three perspectives, however, is that we can focus on doing good works without being rooted in divine grace that is the basis for right deeds. Heavily extrospective sermons tend to be moralistic, change-driven, and program-oriented with slim theology that does not sufficiently engage the meaning and purpose behind our actions and expose and renew our motives. Sermons of this kind can rally the congregation around a vision or a cause and animate them to act initially, but they do not effectively impel people to keep fighting the good fight or remind them from where they have fallen so that they can do the works they did at first. Therefore, the themes that emerge from introspection and extrospection about our inner world and external world should not dictate the sermon's direction or compose the sermon's central content. Um, the sermon is not self-help talk, therapeutic motivational speech, or social advocacy for change, but the church gathers around scripture to hear from the holy God so the principal role of introspection and extrospection is to make us behold God who is at work in us, among us, and around us, enacting his story of salvation and sanctification for all creation so that we may align ourselves with his ways and go out to the world in Christ's name. And finally, uh, the last perspective is prospection, attentiveness to God's future action. Prospection is the act of remembering the future, as Don Saliers calls it, in which we reflect on the unfinished story of God and scripture's promises that God's kingdom, of God's kingdom that's not yet here. With such reflection, this knowledge allows us to live as mature children of God in wisdom, preparing, proclaiming, and participating in what God is bringing to consummation with Christ's return. Our text today was incredibly prophetic and forward-looking. It anticipates the birth of Jesus, but it is also eschatological and, and looking forward to God's judgment and final judgment and reward. So the sermon needed to balance the past and the future because the text is very well rooted in Israel's history and Mary's context, but also points to the great reversal of Christ's kingdom taking place all over the world toward the consummation. And finally, the excerpt for, uh, let me read the prospection. We must practice the four perspectives together because as vital as prospection is, sermons that rely only on it tend to foster fear, confusion, and disorder rather than faith, hope, and love. If our understanding of God's covenantal love does not precede our knowledge of the last days, we have no comfort in facing the judge. Our sermons might frighten or alarm people into behaving well, but since those actions do not come from a transformed heart that has encountered the living word, they are futile, meaningless, and temporary. We must preach the fullness of the gospel by making known the full scope of the theodrama, not only its parts. This does not mean that we have to recite the entire biblical story from the beginning to the end in our sermons every week, but a holistic theological thinking about scripture should frame our sermon and beyond that, undergird our speech and enactment in preaching. Sidney Gradanius asserts a holistic interpretation of biblical text demands further that the interpreter see the message of the text in its broadest possible context, that is scripture's teaching regarding history as a whole. Frequently, this universal historical context is overlooked. There is no doubt, however, that scripture teaches one universal kingdom story, history, that encompasses, encompasses all of created reality, past, present, and future, end quote. Everything we do in the pulpit communicates theology. and something I uh, stress all the time uh, with my students. The question is, what kind of God talk are we currently modeling for our congregations, and what do we, where do we want to go from here? 
So these are the four perspectives. And uh, just really quickly, other considerations for preaching the sermon was matters of form and style, which were huge in this sermon. Uh, the song is, as you can see, uh, uh, it, it, the text is a song. It's very poetic. Um, so rather than doing a three-point sermon, sermon or a very linear deductive sermon, I thought it would be fee fitting for the sermon to be more inductive, descriptive, and evocative. So my sermon tomorrow would be, uh, will be a three-point sermon based on an epistle text. But today for this song, um, it's actually very hard for me to be evocative and descriptive. It's always a challenge for me. <laughs> but I had to push myself to do that because I just felt like that's what the text is. And, and I wanted to respect just God's wisdom and beauty in, 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 in giving us a text that is a song. And I wanted to honor that and, and wanted to echo the text voice. But the challenge then is always to, the, the challenge then is to make a fluid sermon clear and organized because fluid, fluid sermons tend to get lost. And if there aren't clear, um, how do I say, signposts along the way, you can get lost. And, and listeners are, feel like, where are we going? Are we just circling around? Or is there a direction? Are we headed the right way? So the challenge of a very inductive fluid sermons is to give enough signposts so that listeners feel like I'm walking with you, I hear you, and I know we're headed somewhere, and I think I know where the sermon is going. And so that's always the challenge. I also wanted to balance descriptions because it's a very uh, descriptive, evocative sermon. I wanted to balance descriptions like Mary's context, words, and experience, and rather than explaining it as here are three things you should know about Mary's context, or here are some teaching points on that, I kind of wanted to weave in those descriptions naturally into the sermon so that it is more evocative and it kind of pulls you into that story. But to balance those descriptions with enough direct statements to address listeners. So instead of just feeling like you're always an outsider listening into Mary's story, I had to make sure that there were enough direct statements that address you and me as listeners and say, um, you know, as I always tell my students, um, the pronouns that we use are huge in sermons. So sometimes it's appropriate to say, what are you doing? And sometimes it's appropriate to say, I am, the, I am failing at this. I am this way. And other times, the best way to communicate is we are like this and God is addressing us. So to mix up those kinds of pronouns and to to make direct statements that address listeners. So that was something else that I wanted to kind of keep in mind. And lastly, I've been talking a, a, a while, so I'm gonna stop. And so lastly, uh, the other challenge was to capture the joy expressed in this text while still being honest about the reality of pain and suffering and darkness in our world. Um, and I, know, I don't think Mary's uh, song, if you look at the context, it, Luke's gospel begins with um, just in the days of King Herod. I mean, it, it really right away paints this dark picture of a very dark world where the Savior is being born into. So I don't think she is singing in a vacuum, just she's a happy person, but her personal life, her, the world she lives in is, is a very dark place. And so I wanted to balance the joy in this text with the darkness, the reality of pain and suffering and injustice as well. So these are some things that I've thought about. Um, and um, as, we, as we continue to talk, I'm sure I can probably think of more, but thank you for letting me talk for this long. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, I hope that you have all enjoyed uh, this opportunity to hear more from Dr. Lee as well as her sermon. Uh, to hear that that was a sermon that was difficult for you to craft um, leads me to a deeper appreciation. So thank you for sharing with, with us that you were certainly very open within your sermon as well. Um, but that cultivation or that work of cultivating the text um, has certainly been fruitful, so thank you. Um, at this time, when I open this up for questions from you, um, while you're gathering at the microphone, um, so please do, if you have questions for Dr. Lee, um, make your way there. But in the meantime, I do want to point you to her work. Um, so, Preaching God's Grand Drama is an excellent book on preaching, and you've seen a lot of that showcased here. Um, what Dr. Lee has offered us with these four perspectives is in the final chapter. It's one of my favorite parts, so I was really glad that that's what she highlighted today. Um, but what we'd like to do in this question and answer time is really to allow you to tease this out, to think, here's how I've gone about crafting sermons for all this time. Um, here's how I understand my training um, to have been modeled. 
how can I fit um, some of these excellent insights into the process that I already have in place? So um, please ask Dr. Lee anything, um, but those questions about applying the text, about moving from text to sermon, I think will be some of our most fruitful questions. I have one to get the ball rolling, perhaps, while you drink, Dr. Lee. Um, I, I've, again, I, I was so struck by the level of introspection that you offered to us in your sermon. Um, but one of the reasons that that was so influential to me is that I recognize that while this is a familiar setting, that we are not necessarily all familiar faces, that you're very open with us, but you exegeted your audience very well. Could you help us to understand coming into a relatively unfamiliar congregation of sorts. Um, what are some of the steps that you take to apply a sermon to an unfamiliar setting? Thank you. I think that's a great question. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact words, but um, homiletician Leonora Tubbs Tisdale says that the preacher should be like cultural anthropologist. And she says that we should always remember that people are alike. Everyone is um, shares something in common, but there are ways when um, in which where we are we share certain things only in common with certain groups of people. Um, and then there are ways in which we are not like anyone. We are very unique individuals. And I think it's helpful to think about it. Um, she says it much better than me, by the way. Uh, but I'm just, I can't re remember the exact words. But it's something to that effect. And I think it's important to think about those three layers, right? Of how, um, how are we each unique? What are some of the, the burdens, the hurts, our victories, the joys that we each carry uniquely? But at the same time, what are some things that maybe some of you share with some people in the room, like other fe fellow MDivers or fellow, um, you know, uh, 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 people who have families and kids? Um, maybe there are some people who are um, single and you share certain things with just single people, or that you're a woman and you share certain things with women, or a man with men, or. Um, and then there are certain things that, that we all share in common as human beings, that the human condition, the fact that we worry, the fact that, that, that we carry burdens, the fact that we have loved ones or that we fear death or, or the fact that we love God. And so there, those are all things that we think about. And I think thinking about those three layers and preparing for a sermon is always helpful. Um, it's always a good place to start. But I also, um, Tisdale also offers like seven symbols of exegeting a congregation, which I briefly mentioned that in the book as well, but it's, it's a very helpful way of thinking about the congregational culture as you try to understand and adapt your sermon to that, is you, know, you look at the symbols in that culture and think about what is sacred to them, um, what, what, it, what, uh, what are their stories, um, even just the, 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 the look of the chapel, what does that communicate about our understanding of God? Um, some of us go, go to worship spaces where the room is pitch black and there's only one spotlight just on the singer. Now, what does that communicate about worship, worship theology? How do we view God? Um, do we see worship as a communal activity or do we see worship as an individual activity where you can't see or hear the person next to you? And uh, what does that say about our worship? And so, again, I think everything, all these symbols in, in the congregation, in our community, uh, tells us our clues that we should look for to help us kind of understand our listeners and, and then think about how can we then adjust and adapt our message to fit that. Thank you, that's excellent. Other questions? Perhaps you could say a bit more about the processes by which you um, understand those symbols. So how do you come to know what the symbols are for a, a congregation that you're either a part of or that you're visiting? Um, and how do you try to um, understand the meaning of those symbols? Because, of course, symbols can be interpreted and misinterpreted. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I think it's really hard, and I think, uh, you know, it obviously requires a lot of wisdom and prayer. <laughs> um, but I think, um, you know, I think these days, uh, just 
the, the kind of things that you can access uh, just by looking at websites is really helpful. I mean, just like a mission statement or like to watch like previous chapel services and um, what are some some events that are happening in the community? What, what are people thinking about? What seems to be the concern? And obviously at a national level or a global level, I think we, we can tap into news, you know, the news and, and whatnot, but Specific to this this context, you know, I had to to look at the website, look at kind of what's going on, and and look at the events that are coming up, or you know, just look at some of the changes that's been happening. And now I don't know everything. Uh, if you were to quiz me on it, I I probably won't do well. But but I, I made an effort to at least try to make those connections and see this is what's going on, and, and the rest I kind of have to imagine and fill in. Just given the global pandemic, given everything else that's going on, maybe these are some things that that that. Um, would be most meaningful this, to this group. And I think that's where I think your personal story also comes into is when introspection is actually working well, is where you can kind of look in and, and know what you hold and what you're struggling with. And, and I think you can bring that out in the sermon. And it usually, I think, tends to connect with people if you're pretty honest and authentic about it, I think. That's yeah. wonderful. Thanks, yeah. Dr. Lee. Yeah, please. Johanna. Thanks, Dr. Lee. I'm a first year MDiv student here, so just getting ready to start do, working on sermons. <laughs> uh, based on your experience, are there any of the four um, different perspectives that students more often tend to overlook? And do you have any advice on how to be mindful of that and keep that in mind while working on sermons? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say that what is most often overlooked is probably uh, prospection, thinking about the, the biblical story as a whole, so the whole spectrum of biblical story. And I think for a lot of students, because they're going through MDiv, they're still trying to gather the parts and trying to make sense of how it all fits. Um, but that's really where the systematic theology courses really are supposed to help you, is to help you kind of piece everything together, because at the end of the day, we want you to know that seminary education is integrated. It's not different pieces that you have to figure out on your own, but it really is to help you see that there is this, this cohesiveness to the education you're receiving. Um, so I would say, and not just for MDiv students, but I would say for a lot of sermons, I think prospection is often left out, is a lot of sermons just end with, this is who God is, this is what the text says, Jesus died for us, um, and thanks be to God, but it often doesn't tell the whole story or isn't framed by the theology of God's whole story, that, that God is continuing the work, that there is more to come, that there are promises that are being fulfilled. And so I would say that's one thing that tends to get overlooked. Um, however, I do think that it's very hard for MDiv students, I, I think it's hard for any preacher, but especially MDiv students, um, to do retrospection well. So you're so eager to <laughs> please your preaching professor to show that you have done the exegetical work and you have studied the languages and, and you're so eager to show them that, that you've done your homework that I think it's really hard to do that well so that it's seamless in your sermon. Um, the way it often tends to come out if we're not careful, and this is for experienced preachers too, is that it comes out very clunky. So it comes out as information and it's very detached and we just don't know why you're sharing that except we're making mental notes to say, okay, I guess that's important so we should know that. Um, but the way it comes out is very uh, you know, clunky. And, and so I would say to do retrospection well is actually very, very hard. And that's something I would, um, I usually make my students go through about you know, four pages of exegetical notes that they have to answer, which ends up becoming about, you know, it used to be about 10 pages of exegetical notes per sermon, and they preached three sermons in 10 weeks. So that's a lot of work, so I had to reduce it to, to five pages total. Um, but I really believe in the, the importance of exegesis and, and getting into that work of retrospection. So I would say that as well. Great question. Thank you, Thank you very much. That, I think I saw a question at the back. Yeah, please. And if you have a question, feel free to go ahead and kind of congregate, of course, with social distancing. Cool. My name is Luke. I'm a fourth year MDiv student. Um, one question I've been pondering on, this is not maybe per pertinent to your book that you discussed about, is more about the question I've been asking is, what is distinctly Asian American preaching? And I ask that because you know, with black church, there's something unique and distinct about what black preaching is. 
But I've been wondering, what is it about um, someone that is Asian American? And I've recognized that obviously, I'm, are you Korean, by the way? I am okay, Korean. cool. Yes. Me too, cool. Um, <laughs> I mean, like, what is Korean preaching? Maybe Asian Americans too wide. Uh, there's Southeast Asian, there's East Asian, but one of the curiosities I've been just asking myself is, what is unique to Asian Americans to say, ah, yeah, that is Asian American preaching. I can totally identify with that. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on to what that might be or for your own experiences. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you're right. I think Asian American would be too broad, and I, I think it would. My answer would be very, very unfair to some groups of Asian Americans. So I'm going to limit it to Korean American, or, or maybe, maybe it's somewhat applicable to some East Asian Americans. Um, I mean, I think many. Uh, by the way, there's a really good book um, by Matthew Kim, who was a ROM lecturer, I believe, about four years ago. Uh, Matthew, uh, who's a friend of mine, uh, he's at Gordon Conwell right now, he wrote a book called Finding Our Voices, which is actually for Asian Americans. And so I would recommend that book. He gets into some of the things that, that I will mention here. But I think one big idea is this idea of oppression and marginalization. Um, I think this is often applicable to a lot of Asian Americans, and I know that you know black brothers and sisters also understand this experience well. But I think even just the, the colonial history of Asia, is it, it shapes our theology and our, our understanding. So for example, in Korea, there is a particular term called Han, right? It's a Han, which is some of you are nodding. Uh, it's probably something you've heard from your Korean friends too. Uh, it's a very hard expression to translate. It's this term for anguish, sorrow, um, this warmth, this attachment. And that term came about because of the, the history of oppression and col uh, colonization in Korea. And so uh, what a lot of Korean theologians have noticed is that Korean sermons tend to be marked by that Han, and it actually connects people really well. So kind of like the African-American uh, preaching, which you see in homiletical literature, a lot of people point this out. I'm no expert at this, but um, and if you look at a lot of African-American preaching literature, they talk about celebration as this key. It's this expression of liberation to celebration. So um, in a lot of their sermons, it starts by talking about just people's everyday experience of being oppressed and um, being marginalized. And eventually the sermon leads to a point of that celebration of God as uh, the one who, kind of like very fitting for today's sermon too, uh, this, this, uh, this God who acts on their behalf to liberate them and save them. And, um, and so I, I think it's kind of like that. I think that Han relates very well with Asian American congregations in um, connecting with people, even immigrant experiences too, just the fact that they are seen oftentimes invisible in the society um, and that people have that experience of being marginalized and, and forgotten. Um, so I would say that that's something that's really big to Asian American preaching that um, you know, you can see in other sermons as well, but I would say is very often, I think it's very common, it's a common theme in Asian American sermons. Good question, and thank you, Dr. Thank you. Lee. Others? Hi, my name is Kayla. I am a first year systematic theology student, and um, one of my questions that I've been pondering about is, um, what you mentioned earlier about structure. How do you move from like a three-point sermon to something more inductive? How do you analyze a text and, and look into how it should be communicated and delivered? That's a great question and a very hard one to answer. Um, you know, I, I, I think the best answer is let the text guide you. The text has its own form and in this particular case the, the, the case, the text we looked at was very fluid, but there is structure, right? It begins with Mary praising God for who he is, but then she turns into her story and she talks about her story and her testimony. And then it fans out to what God has done for Israel and for all those who fear God. And it is very forward looking in that. And so there is that internal structure, but it's also very poetic. Um, and so I wanted to pay attention to what the text was doing and how the text was organized. But at the same time, I wanna be mindful that the text is a song and it, it, it is that, it's, it is fluid. And so um, that's why I chose induction. Um, but instead of, by the way, for those of you who are kind of wondering, induction is when you kind of have 
smaller particular ideas throughout the sermon and by the end you have that big idea like aha comes out at the end as opposed to deduction which is where you begin with this big proposition right and then um, and then you have like three points that support the proposition to kind of say this is what comes out of the proposition and um, and that's how what deduction is now i'm generalizing but that's kind of what it is so an inductive sermon would kind of um, uh, be punctuated by smaller particular ideas that say, okay, I got you, I got you, I'm following, I get this. And then by the end, everything comes together and says, ah, this is what the text is about. This is what the text is calling us to do. And really, I think the best way to say, uh, best advice is let the text guide you and sit with it, uh, wrestle with it, play around with different forms until you feel like it's actually matching the text voice the best. Um, just to give you an example, I began this sermon um, by talk, jumping right into Mary's story, actually, what, my first draft. I went through multiple drafts, by the way, um, and I felt like it just wasn't right. I felt like it was disconnected from listeners. It was disconnected from me. It just doesn't, didn't grab my heart. So I often don't like talking about myself um, in my sermons, and um, I particularly don't like doing that in the introduction, but I just felt like it was right to begin by just even briefly mentioning my childhood and how I used to sing all the time, but I have a hard time singing now, and I just felt like that was appropriate for this sermon. And I think I got that form eventually by like the, I think by like second or third draft. So I would say just sit with it, let the text guide you, keep on looking at it, keep on editing it uh, until you feel like the, the form you have actually matches the text really well. Um, and I think uh, you know, your preaching professors would tell you the same thing about even propositions, right? What Trinity is very good at teaching is that proposition statement. Even that, you have to edit it multiple times until it feels right and it captures the text really well. So uh, don't be discouraged if you feel like you're editing too much. I would just say, get it done before it's your turn to preach in the lab. So, uh, but until then, you're, you're good if you keep on editing. Yeah, That's great. And I'm glad that the Spirit led you to make that choice. It was great in the sermon. Others? Yeah, Tali. Dr. Lau. Uh, my name is Tali, and thanks again for coming to preach, all right? I really do appreciate it. I had a question with regards to what uh, Luke had asked about this Korean preaching or black preaching itself. And you talk about in Korean, it talks about this necessity of emphasizing suffering, and also in terms of black preaching, in terms of liberationist thing. But if I am to do an expository preaching and to let the text drive the theme of my preaching, then in what way, if I'm, if I'm to be sensitive to the theme of the passage, but yet also bring in these distinctive experiences for the community, how do I then do that well? Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, I think the text is at the end of the day, it's about the tech, the world of the text and our world kind of kind of weaving and just kind of dialoguing. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. I think that's a huge challenge to let let the text and our world dialogue well. So in an Asian American case, it would be to let our culture and our current situation dialogue with the text. Um, again, how do we do that? I think kind of like the sermon form. I think there are appropriate moments that, that in the sermon where um, there will be appropriate moments that are presented to us where we just feel like this is actually the right moment to bring in our story. Um, sometimes you might insert it and then you realize later on, no, actually, I think I'm kind of just interrupting the text flow so that you might just pull it back out, which I did many times in this sermon writing too. Um, I inserted certain things and I felt like it just doesn't feel right, so I had to pull it back out and wait until the right time. And I think that if we are sitting with the text and just going through multiple drafts, I think we really honestly let the text and our culture dialogue. We will find those moments where um, it just feels right to let the, the really a penetrating question rise and be honest. Uh, one thing I tell my students all the time is don't be afraid to ask those honest, very difficult, penetrating questions. And it doesn't mean that we have answers to those questions all the time, but I think that's how we get the best conversations going in that sermon, where people can kind of, kind of listen in and say, oh, th that's interesting. At least I'm seeing how God is really speaking to me and how God is just uh, uh, getting messy with, with the questions and, and the things that I'm wrestling with. And, and I think it's refreshing for people to see that. 
um, and we don't have to tie a nice bow at the end, uh, you know, to, to wrap it all up. Uh, but I think that that kind of honest dialoguing with the text that shows that we're wrestling through um, is what people tend to look for. And there will be moments in the sermons where it kind of presents itself um, as we, uh, you know, as we sit with it and, and look at it. I, I know that there's no clear um, formula or, or answer to this, not that, not that you probably had that in mind, but, but I, I really wish there was. Um, but, you know, sometimes all I can tell my students is, you know, just, just sit with it, just, just keep on working on it and, and, and see what develops and, and just at least promise that you're gonna be honest and, and to keep asking honest questions, difficult questions, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Harris. I just would like to hear you talk a little bit more about the pronouns, about the yeah. I, the we, the you. I think mm. that's a really key point, mm. and I would love to just hear you kind of expand on that. Yes, I, um, I am not, um, by the way, Dr. Harris was my professor, and I'm, I am deeply indebted to her. Uh, but I, yeah, you know, I, I just think that I don't have this clear philosophy about this yet. Maybe one day, if I can develop and articulate this better, I might actually write something on it. Um, but I just felt like uh, there were times when I was preaching and I just wasn't connecting with listeners. And I didn't know why. And I think there's many reasons why a sermon can go wrong. Um, but I think one thing is language. Um, sometimes I think uh, we, uh, our, you know, our language reflects our theology, and sometimes instead of saying our God, which would be more appropriate, uh, sometimes we say uh, your God or my God. And it's okay, that's true, but I think it loses something really important theologically at that moment to bring the room together. Um, so one thing I all, often tell my students is everything we do from the pulpit communicates theology. Um, how you look, the examples you, you use, the illustrations you use, everything you do communicates theology. So for example, if, you are, if you're using illustrations that are always, always uh, about, you know, imagine this, like, you know, look at the sky, um, uh, look at the person running over there, um, have you seen the TV? And it's all oriented toward vision, it's, it's vision oriented. What if there was someone in your congregation who doesn't, who can't see? Um, what does that say about our God to that person? Uh, what if your illustrations are all about, you know, sports analogies, which I think many of us tend to do, uh, but if that's the case, and what if someone in your congregation um, is not able to participate in sports, they, 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 they can't move their bodies easily, uh, what does that say about God? So I don't think it's just the pronouns, but I think it's true about our whole language, right? What language we use, what does that communicate about our God? So I think it's important that when we preach our language, we are mindful about language so that it reflects, uh, you know, the theology that, 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 that we want to teach our congregations. Um, so in certain moments, um, I think you is a very powerful word. It, it's, it's great when you want to just invite reflection, invite action. I think you is a very particularly strong pronoun for that. Um, but I think there are times when, oftentimes, when it's about reflection, like introspection, that should kind of models for the congregation, I'm thinking too. In fact, I'll be the first one to admit that I have a problem with this. I, I think the pronoun I is great for that, um, to, to kind of you know, put yourself down and say, you know, I'm struggling, so how about you? And, and you can always transition into that. But obviously, you know, the pronoun of, of us is, is central to Christian theology. And, you know, I try to be mindful of using that more than uh, anything else um, in, in the sermons, actually. So, you know, I would say in general, uh, use the pronoun I uh, very carefully. Because <laughs> I think so many times, uh, so often, our sermons tend to be dominated by I. I did this, I did that, I was like this the other day, my friend said this, and my friend did that. Um, I would say there's a simple way to correct that. Just instead of saying I, just say this person did this. <laughs> just take the, remove the I. Um, and I would say use you care carefully too because it can be very direct, it can be very powerful. Um, and so just be mindful of that. And generally I would say think about the story of us and, and, and what God is doing among us, in us, and, and through us. And so um, that's just something that I try to be mindful about. Thank you.
I think we have time for maybe one more brief question. Um, my name is Josh. I'm an MDiv student. Uh, I have a, a question considering the, the prospection aspect. Um, you preach from the New Testament, but when preaching from the Old Testament, you know, many texts have an aspect of, oh, in the future, in Jesus, this has been fulfilled. Um, so I'm curious as to what your thoughts are if, if that aspect of bringing Jesus and the cross into it uh, satisfies the prospection aspect or if you should go one step further and, you know, include uh, Jesus' second coming uh, and, and how you balance that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say, you know, uh, let the text guide you in that as well. Um, but I do have to say, and I know Dr. McGarry's here, and he's more of an expert, um, and so please talk to him. Uh, but I, I do think that there are many Old Testament texts that really talk about the day of the Lord. And it really is eschatological. It is very forward-looking. And so really, depending on the text you're dealing with, I would say there are still um, things in the Old Testament that, that really foreshadow Christ. It, it is looking forward to uh, Christ who will fulfill all the promises and all the expectations. So there are glimmers in that text. And so I would say just be sensitive to that. There's more than we realize. And there's always a way. People need to hear the good news. As Bard would say, people need to hear the good news every time a sermon is preached. So just be mindful of that. But there are also more explicit passages where I think it really does talk about the future glory of God, the, the judgment of God, and, 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 and really the day of the Lord when the, the Lord will renew all things, reset all things. And I mean, the Old Testament is filled with those things. And so whether it's God's vindication or God's judgment or reward, there's so many passages that comfort people, that, that hold people to God's standard because it's so forward-looking and about you know, the coming day of the Lord. And so, um, yes, be sensitive to the text. Let the text guide you. Um, but I do think that, again, just look at the whole theology of the, the four perspectives that are presented and just think about you know, what is the best way to present this that's true of our spiritual lives, our Christian life today, because you're preaching to people today in real life. Um, and, and these are people who know, you know, who live now and on this side of the cross. So you want to be mindful of where they are in their context as well as you think about, you know, how does this passage then relate to them? How can I speak to them to preach the whole story of God and not just what's happened many, many years ago in this particular passage in Isaiah or something? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, we want to thank you again. Uh, and I'd like, uh, Madison, if you could pray over Dr. Lee and her ministry and so on. But let, let's say thanks again. We appreciate your time. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are so thankful for the gift that you have given us through Dr. Lee. We thank you, Lord, that um, she has gone out from here, from Ted's, and has has honed her craft, that she's continued to learn, that she's continued to find ways of honoring you through her work and her preaching and her life. We pray, Lord, that you um, continue to give her a rich and fruitful ministry. We pray, Lord, that you give her wisdom and strength. We pray, Lord, that you continue to give her this beautiful prophetic voice that you have instilled within her, strengthen it. We pray, Lord, that you provide her with safety as she travels home. And we thank you again, Lord, for the tremendous gift that she's been to our community. Amen. Uh, I've been told, I asked the folks that made this, can you take some? They said yes with exclamation points. So if you think you'd like a sandwich,